Hello, uh, Tansi. Uh, my name is Sakawis Nobis, and I am the executive director of Great Plains Action Society. Uh, and um, today uh, we are here to listen and learn uh, on the impact of historical and intergenerational trauma on the Two Spirit and Native LGBTQ uh, community. And uh, we will be uh, joined by uh, Lenny Hayes. Uh, and I'm, I'm very excited about this project because uh, this is something that's been very near and dear to my heart for a long time uh, because in Iowa, uh, Nebraska, um, there really isn't a lot of resources uh, and discussion uh, and space for Native Two-Spirit uh, and LGBTQ folks. And so uh, Great Plains Action Society, uh, you know, we've been um, looking, you know, and and trying to create space. And, uh, you know, we're really proud to see some uh, folks doing great work, uh, like the uh, Winnebago uh, Two-Spirit Committee uh, that was founded about a year and a half ago. So we're proud to see that happening. Um, and also, I wanted to give a big shout out to One Iowa, uh, who we've partnered with um, on this event. Uh, and, uh, you know, they, um, they're doing uh, incredible work uh, in the state of Iowa lobbying for, um, you know, Two-Spirit uh, and LGBTQIA rights. And um, I would like to get into this uh, presentation. And so I'm going to bring Lenny up here uh, and introduce Lenny to everybody. Hello, Lenny. Hello. Hi, and I'm going to read everybody uh, just a short part of your bio, uh, because frankly, it's amazing. <laughs> You've been doing a lot. And <laughs> I, uh, I I posted your bio actually in the chat so everybody can read the rest of it. But I do want to say uh, Lenny Hayes is a citizen of the Sisseton Wapton Oyate of the northeast corner of South Dakota. Lenny is also owner and operator, and excuse me, I hope I get this right. I meant to ask you ahead of time. Tate Topa Consulting, LLC. Yes. Okay, great. And is currently in private practice specializing in marriage family therapy. He has an extensive training in mental and chemical health issues that impact the two-spirit Native LGBTQ and Native community. Lenny has traveled nationally and locally training and presenting on the issues that impact both the two-spirit Native LGBTQ individual and community. These issues include the impact of historical and intergenerational trauma on this population, violence of all forms, child welfare issues, and the impact of sexual violence on men and boys, which is a topic that is rarely discussed. Lenny is the former Missing and Murdered Two-Spirit Project Assistant for Sovereign Bodies Institute and also a 2020 graduate of the Human Trafficking Leadership Academy cohort, number five. Now, there is so much more that Lenny's involved in, and uh, please take a look in the chat um, because it's there and also in the Facebook page um, overview. Um, and I just, you know, want to say welcome, Lenny. Thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I wanted to, to let everybody know, um, if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook and you have questions, please don't be afraid to put them in the chat and we will have a question and answer period at the end. Um, and for now, uh, I'm just going to give it to you, Lenny. Uh, take it away. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Did that slide come up? There it is. All right. Good Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and so one of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight is the impact of historical and intergenerational trauma on the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ. But also, I'm going to give some historical context of some of our ancestors who identified um, what I also want to say about this presentation is that I'm not specifically talking about one tribe, but I'm going to be talking about various different tribes. Um, and I want to be respectful to all of our uh, communities across Indian country with individuals who identify as either Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ, and I'll get more into that into the presentation. So we as Indian people always introduce ourselves in a good way 
so I come here in, in a good way um, and want to help educate and bring awareness of the many, many different issues that really impacts this community. This community is often a forgotten and underserved community, not only in our tribal communities, but across uh, the U.S. And so this is who I am. My name is Tukawanahi Luta, which means Redstone Ghost. My English name is Lenny Hayes, and I'm from the Sisseton Wapatin Oyate of the northeast corner of South Dakota. I am owner and operator of Tate Topa Consulting. I'm a mental and chemical health therapist specializing in marriage family therapy. I'm also an advocate, a mentor, an educator, and a motivational speaker. Um, in my language, I would I, I would be identified as a winkta. That's the word that was given to me by my people. And then secondly, I will identify as a two-spirit male. And then lastly, I will identify as a gay male. So for me, um, calling myself a winkta is the word that was given to me by my people. And so for me, I look at that as sort of decolonizing um, the way that I used to think before and only identified as a gay male. But once I went through a lot of my own personal healing um, and sat with a lot of two-spirit elders and talked with them and learned uh, a lot about uh, two-spirit identity, um, I always identify myself first as a winkta. I'm also a survivor of the child sex, I'm a survivor of child, child sexual, physical, and mental abuse, and I'm also a survivor of the foster care system. So when I go into tribal communities, um, and I've been to a lot of tribal communities across Indian country, one of the things that I uh, like to ask the audience, um, and this is a question that I always like to ask people, do you know the word in your language that would identify someone like me? What were you taught? Was it good or was it bad? So one of the things, um, one of the reasons why I like to ask this question is because we know before colonization, each of our tribes across Indian country actually had a word uh, to identify someone like me. Um, in our languages across Indian country, we didn't have a word for gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender. We had one word to identify who we were, uh, both for male or female, or often there was a word for both genders. Um, and one of the things that I've also learned in, in talking with a lot of our elders across Indian country is that, you know, we didn't have a word for transgender. Um, we identified them as who they are. So if they identified and lived their lives as a woman, that's how we viewed them. And that wasn't a bad thing. So as I begin to talk about the historical um, um, intergenerational intergenerational trauma on the community, then you'll be, uh, be you'll begin to understand um, what was taken away from us and what was taken away from our people. So this is a definition that just uh, came out in 2021. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar with Muffy and Philippa. Um, and, and they are from the Oglala Sioux tribe. And so one of the things that that they did a lot of really good work and have been doing a lot of good work in South Dakota in regards to really getting uh, the Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ uh, recognized. So they met with three of the original elders, who was Clyde Hall, Marlon Fixio, and Beverly Little Thunder. And they also were assisted by Senator Red Don Foster. And what they did was they came up with this specific term um, this new definition, and I, I have to say personally, I love this new definition because one of the things that I've been seeing across different areas of the country and just, you know, even in um, different, you know, within the LGBTQ community is that often we hear a lot of individuals who identify who are non-Native and they're calling themselves Two-Spirit. So with this new definition, it just really, really, I could really connect with this definition. So what, the, what they said, or this new definition says, is that two-spirit refers to a person of a culturally and spiritually distinct gender exclusively recognized by Native American nations. So again, I, I really, really um, love this new definition. So what does it mean to be two-spirit? So the term two-spirit comes from the Ojibwe language. And what that means is that that a person who identifies 
houses both a masculine and feminine spirit. This term came about in 1990 at the, uh, the third annual, um, excuse me, the third annual Two-Spirit Travel Native American First Nations Gay Lesbian Conference in Winnipeg. And so when we talk about the term Two-Spirit, what that means is that, um, as an example, so when we talk about first gender, we say that the first gender identifies a heterosexual male. The second gender identifies a heterosexual female. The third gender identifies the two-spirit male. And the fourth gender identifies the two-spirit female. So again, um, one of the things that I really want to stress is, and for everyone to remember this, is that not all tribes across Indian country connect with the term two-spirit. One of the reasons why the term two-spirit was um, was created, from my understanding and listening to some of the stories of these elders, is that they wanted to connect more to the culture and spirituality and more to the identity and the roles that two-spirit people play in community. And so a lot of them wanted to get away from that mainstream language of LGBTQ. Um, and so... Knowing that, you know, if you think about it today, we have, what, 574 tribes across um, Indian country um, with over, what, I would say 200 languages. And so they knew that they couldn't just, you know, pick a word from, uh, from some tribal community. So they came up with this term, um, which, was, uh, which has really helped them to really um, understand and really connect to that, that meaning of that cultural and spiritual connection. So when we talk about a person who identifies as two-spirit, uh, we say that that person is given the gift of being two-spirit. It means that the individual has the ability to see the world in two different perspectives at the same time. So often when I'm out doing uh, a training and in-person training, I always like people to really sort of um, think about what does this mean to you? Um, often for me, when I look at that, it means for me, I'm able to look at the world as a female and as a male um, and, and give different perspectives on different things that, you know, may come up or whatever. So for me, that's what that means. So I always encourage people to sort of think about this slide and, and what does that mean to you? Will Roscoe, um, who's an anthropologist, um, did a lot of research and study on individuals who identified as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ. Um, but what he came across is that he writes that male and female Two-Spirits have been documented in over 130 tribes in every region of North America among every type of Native culture. So again, remember um, what I had just, uh, who I identify in the term winkta in my language. So I always like to present this to give that people, give people that understanding, you know, going back to that question that I asked, do you know the word in your language? So if you look at the left column, there's a tribe, the middle, the middle column is the term, and then the uh, third column is gender. So what we have here is the Crow, the Navajo, the Lakota, and the Zuni people um, in their term, and then the gender it identifies. Now, when I was saying earlier about that some tribes don't connect with the term two-spirit, uh, one of them would be the Navajo people. So a lot of my Na Navajo colleagues will often call themselves um, Native LGBTQ. They will not call themselves two-spirit within their community because um, it has a totally, totally different meaning. So in their language, um, some of them will often call themselves not lay, which identifies a male or female. But also from my understanding that the word not lay is such a very powerful word in their um, language and within their culture. Um, from my understanding, it means that um, continuously transforming. Um, that's sort of the understanding that I have um, gotten from talking with my native um my Navajo colleagues. Um, one of the things that they also talk about is that often sometimes some of them will call themselves two-spirit outside of their community, but not within their community um, because they want to be respectful to their Navajo community. Um, 
And that's okay if they call themselves to spirit outside of their community, which is fine. So again, I'm, I, I really want to be clear about like all Navajo people who identify, some will call themselves native LGBTQ and some won't. Some will call themselves two spirit and some will call them uh, call themselves native LGBTQ. So again, um, it's a universal term that's used across Indian country, but it's also important to remember that a lot of these communities, a lot of tribal communities don't call themselves two spirit. So when I talk about this also, what I always like to remind people is that it's really important for us to ask individuals how do you identify just because they may be native they may identify but they may not call themselves two-spirit so again the most important thing the most respectful thing that you could do with a native individual who identifies is just simply ask them how do you identify So again, here are some different words um, and different tribes, um, the words of um, individuals who identify um, and the word in their language and then what it means behind it. Um, I was really, really honored to have um, been able to spend some time with Clyde Hall and also um, Spirit Wildcat. And so when I seen this slide in one of their pre uh, presentations, I had asked them, if it was okay if I use these slides, because again, for me, this was a learning experience because a lot of these words I've never heard of, or you know, the words that come from different tribes, um, and just the meaning behind it. So again, this is a very, very powerful slide. So it's very important to remember that genders vary from tribe to tribe, but are similar. So when I talk about the Midwest and some of our tribes in the Midwest, often our tribes will identify four genders. Um, and it's really common within the uh, Midwest. I just uh, did a training a couple months ago in Wisconsin um, with one of the tribes and learned that in their tribe, they identified five genders. Now, when I talk about the Navajo people in their culture, they have identified eight genders. So again, it's important to remember that genders vary from tribe to tribe. The other thing to really remember too is that there are tribes that do not have um, words for gender. So again, you know, one of the things that I um, that I really remind people too is that one of the things that's happening today is that we a lot of times we're forced to use genders. Um, I, I, I just really want to say that um, I want to be respectful to the people who use genders and it's okay. But what I what I don't like is often that is that sometimes we're forced to use genders. So when somebody says to me, say your name, your title, and which gender do you use? Um, often I will respond by saying to them, um, I don't use uh, pronouns or uh, yeah, pronouns, because I believe it's a form of colonization. Now, if you really think about it, and all the conversations that I've had with elders across Indian country is that before colonization, um, we didn't really view people in that sense of that deep understanding of gender identity. Um, we were very respectful to everyone. And so often I've heard elders say, why do we have to do that? Um, I don't understand. Um, so again, it's just that understanding that um, that's forced upon us. Um, and so, but again, I just really want to be respectful to people who want to use pronouns, which is okay. But what I'm asking people also is to respect individuals who don't want to use pronouns. So now I'm going to go into showing you some historical figures. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you have seen these individuals. Again, you know, wherever I go, I'm always learning something new. Um, and so I'm going to share some of the slides that um, I was at, that I had asked to use um, permission to use them because they were new to me. So one of the first individuals that we always talk about is Wima. Uh, today, we would identify Wima as a transgender. Um, she was born a male, but lived her life as a female. And she, came, and she comes from the Zuni uh, Pueblo people. Um, she was a cultural ambassador. Um, she was well known for her artistry as a weaver and a potter. Um, one of the important roles that she played in her community was that she was an ambassador 
to the United States government um, and actually traveled to Washington, D.C. on the behalf of our people. The sad part about her story is that when the delegates from Washington, D.C. actually found out that she was a man, they shunned her. Um, and so she went back to her tribal community um, and just worked within her tribal community. And again, she was well respected by her people. Um, she was well loved by all the children. Um, you know, and she's just a, a very amazing person. So again, there is books written about uh, Weewa if you're interested in reading more about her. Hostin Claw, he comes from the Diné people. Um, he was considered a third gender native person. Um, he was a Navajo medicine man and he was the master weaver. One of the amazing things about Hostin Claw is that he mastered um, um, all of the eight different Navajo spiritual ceremonies, uh, while the typical medicine person only mastered two. Um, a lot of his work, his rugs are still hung, hung in um, museums. Um, and again, you know, he was, he was well respected in his community. Ashtish. Ashtish was considered a third gender person. Um, he was assigned male at birth, but dressed in women's clothes and performed women's roles in her tribe in a coronation. So again, she um, called herself either uh, he or her or she or him. Um, but again, she um, was considered a, a leader among other third gender people of her tribe. So again, I mean, it's really, it's really uh, nice to see all these ancestors because it really, really brings that understanding that we as individuals who identify as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ, we've always been here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, here's a picture of Charlie the Weaver. Um, he was also a member of the Navajo tribe. Um, he was a weaver um, and sometimes he would often wear clothing that differed from, that differed from both male and female styles. Pine Leaf Woman. I love to talk about Pine Leaf Woman. Uh, I'm just so fascinated with her. But she was actually a chief and a warrior for the Crow people. Um, she uh, went out and hunted and went on war expeditions with, um, with the men. Um, we would probably identify her as a lesbian uh, today because of the fact that she didn't wear men's clothing, but she wore women's clothing. One of the most beautiful things about her was that um, she married four, she had four wives, uh, which increased the wealth and prestige of her lodge. So again, I love to talk about Pine Leaf Woman. Um, here is two Lakota women um, who lived to be in their 90s, um, who lived together until their death in 1890. Um, so again, these are pictures of individuals who identified, um, and and this was a picture that I got from um, Clyde Hall and Spirit Wildcat, um, because this is the first time I have ever seen this picture. Now, there's controversy, but there's also this um, this understanding that a Crazy Horse actually had at least one two spirit wife, a male to female two spirit. Um, one of the things I also heard about uh, Crazy Horse also, too, was that his right-hand person identified and was uh, someone who gave him a lot of, um, um, what would you call it, um, support, um, gave him a lot of understanding, um, helped him to make decisions. Um, so again, you know, these are things that we don't even talk about. So I was really fascinated when I heard this story of Crazy Horse. Um, this is George, um, George Winch Tendori, who comes from the Shoshone Bannock um, people, uh, the Shoshone people. And again, this was a, this was an individual that I learned about um, just several months back when I was out there doing a symposium um, um, with their because they were celebrating um, Pride Month. So again, it was it was fascinating to hear about George and what he's done for his people. Um, and he was considered a keeper of a tribal culture, traditions, and songs. Um, was a well-known craft and bead worker, peace, uh, peacemaker for the tribe. 
And here are some other historic, historical individuals, uh, blue dog eyes, and here's a picture of a female to male. So again, you know, um, we've always been here. Um, it's not like we just uh, just appear today. These are our ancestors. Um, I always like to call them my ancestors. These are individuals who identified, who played different roles within their tribal communities. So before colonization, <clears throat> individuals who identified as two-spirit um, or native LGBTQ, so again, you can see that I'm going back and forth from saying two-spirit and native LGBTQ is because I want to be respectful to the individuals who do not call themselves two-spirit and only call themselves uh, native LGBTQ. But these are some of the community roles that we played before colonization. We were healers or medicine people. We were parents of orphan children. We were conveyors of oral tradition, foretellers of the future, name givers of children and adults, um, which still happens today, um, nurses during war expedition, potters, matchmakers, makers of feather regalia, and they played special roles in the Sundance. So I know of two individuals, a Lakota male and a, uh, a female Dakota, who actually um, run or is a leader in the sun, within their um, Sundance. So we know that that's happening today. One of the things that I always say too is that because of colonization, often what is ha what has happened is that um, individuals who identify um, today are usually often called um, abusers, sexual abusers. Um, I've heard so many different stories from people. I mean, I've had the opportunity to sit with a lot of individuals and hear their stories and um, often sometimes the adults around them or just people in general around them would, you know, tell their children to stay away from individuals who identified because they said that they would hurt them sexually. And history tells us that our two-spirit people um, actually took care of orphan children. So, and then when we talk about today, one of the things that, that has helped me to understand my role as an individual who identifies a Winkta, but also identifies as a person, um, a two-spirit person, is that um, I see myself as, as either a healer or a medicine person just because of the work that I do. I sit with people, I counsel them, I listen to them, I give them advice. So that would be my role as a uh, individual who identifies. When I was in Wisconsin, I um, I was very honored to sit with an individual who was male, male-bodied, um, and he was telling me about the things that he loves to do. Like one of the things he talked about is like, I take care of my niece and my nephew. Um, I love to bead and he does beautiful bead work and um, does other forms of artwork. So when he was telling me this and he finished his conversation, what he didn't know, which was really surprising to him, was I said to him, that's the role that you play as someone who identifies. You take care of children um, and, and you do beautiful artwork. Those are your roles as an individual who identifies. So two-spirit people were treated with the utmost respect and honor before colonization. Uh, what I do want to say about this, I don't know if a lot of you know this, but this beautiful artwork that um, talks about individuals who identify um, is, is um, artwork by Will Davis, who is also an elder, um, I believe, who lives currently in Florida. Um, I've had the honor to meet him um, at the first um, ever um, Two-Spirit powwow in San Francisco that I went to, the Bates powwow. Um, I, I was able to go right before COVID uh, hit. So I was able to also meet this, um, this amazing elder. So what happened to honor and respect? So when the missionaries and the Europeans came in to, to our lands, and they seen individuals like us and how accepting it was within our community to, you know, to see two individuals of the same sex together who were also married. Um, 
perform roles within their community. Um, so when the Europeans missionaries came in, it didn't live up to their standards of, um, uh, of how they believed. And so they actually started murdering two-spirit people. Now, we also know that the uh, missionaries and Europeans did a lot of damage to uh, our people who identify as Native. So one of the things that I've learned and what I've heard um, just talking with scholars, talking with elders, is that our chiefs and leaders loved us so much that they actually hid us. And they loved us so much because of the roles that we played in community, but they also forgot about us. That's the impact of historical and intergenerational trauma on this community. Because again, you know, we were well loved, we were well respected, um, we were looked upon because of the roles that we played in community. And colonization has changed even our own Native people's view of how they see us as individuals who identify. Um, I'm not sure if a lot of you have seen this, but this is actually a, a picture that uh, is often online. This is a picture of uh, Spaniards. Um, and this was in California, one of the California tribes. And when they came in, when they identified individuals who identified as today, as we call two-spirit or native LGBTQ, they actually threw them in the pit um, and allowed the war dogs to tear them apart. So this, this picture is um, um, famous and you see it, you could find it online. You read in, you read about it in books. Um, so again, this is like one of the, the horrible, horrific things that happened to individuals who identified as Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ during um, uh, the beginning of colonization. One of the things that I always like to talk about too, uh, especially in the work that I do in regards to violence prevention, um, I'm not sure if a lot of you know what this is a picture of. Um, and so please excuse me if you already do, but this is a, a picture of the Carlisle Boarding School. Um, this was the first boarding school where a lot of our children were stripped away from their families and were forced to go to this boarding school. What we know of is that the children's hair was cut. Um, we know that a lot of the children were physically and emotionally abused as well as being sexually abused. Um, one of the things that we also know of that history tells us is that the, the nuns and the priests actually did horrible, horrible things to these children. And we know what's happening across Canada, what's happening across the U.S. is that they're finding a lot of these unmarked graves of um, our children. But the reason why I like to show this picture, and this was a conversation with uh, a colleague of mine who also identifies, and we're sitting and looking at this picture, and what we know of, what history tells us, that in some tribes, when children were coming out, or when they came out, um, they actually had celebrations and ceremonies for these children. Um, one specific tribe that I like to talk about, um, because I learned this and he's a very good friend of mine and he, he also identifies from the Apache tribe, one of the Apache tribes. And what he said was that, um, what he learned was that when a child was coming out and they always say a mother knows when her child is different and that, and that's not meant in a bad way. It's just knowing that her child is different and it was a good thing. And so what they did was um, often was that they would put a male or female object in front of that child and whatever that child went to first, that's how they raised their child. And that wasn't a bad thing. So again, it's just learning about all these different things um, that happened within tribes when children came out. But one of the things that we talked about was that Today, statistics tells us that one out of 10 individuals, um, out of one, out of one, excuse me, one out of 10 individuals, um, one of them identifies in, a, in when we talk about statistics uh, as uh, LGBTQ or two-spirit or native LGBTQ. So it's really important to know that. So when we were having this conversation, our, our, I guess, uh, conversation was how many of those children do you think may have identified? 
And so when we talk about violence uh, and sexual violence against um, children who identify, we know that these priests and nuns um, groom these children. Um, so again, this is really, really important to think about. So when we talk about historical and intergenerational trauma in this community, one of the things that, um, that I know of um, through my work uh, through community work, and just often just sitting with people um, who identify and hearing their stories. Um, but these are a lot of the issues that impacts um, individuals who identify as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ. Now, when I talk about this slide also, I always like to remind people, please do not think that every one of these issues um, um, individuals who identify experience every one of them. They don't. Okay, so um, I'm always reminding people, please don't put labels on them and, and don't assume that their exp um, experiences are all the same, they're different. Um, one of the things that I learned in my work in working with individuals who identify is that one of the two major things that I hear all the time is that a lot of our individuals who identify grow up and when they're able to, will often leave their tribal communities and will migrate to the bigger cities um, looking for more support. Um, but in reality, what we know of is that a lot of our LGBTQ organizations um, that do a lot of good work often don't understand that the deep wounds that have occurred on individuals who identify. So what I know of and and what I have seen also is that I have friends from South Dakota who identify who have actually traveled to Minnesota just to be in the sweat lodge because, um, you know, our, our Native men and our Native women actually shunned them, um, made fun of them, and never allowed them to be a part of the sweat lodge. So I've heard a lot of those stories. So when I say Two of, the, two of the things that I have heard that really impacts individuals who identify is that loss of Native identity and the loss of culture. Um, so again, you know, a lot of them have talked about not being able to be a part of ceremony, um, being shunned, um, and so, and just that loss of culture. So in Minneapolis, what we did was, and, and I, I feel so honored and blessed to have been a part of that, but the Minnesota Indian Women's um, Resource Center was actually one of the first organizations that created a Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ support group. So again, um, it was amazing just to sit with all these individuals and hear their stories, but also give them a lot of encouragement and love and just practicing those cultural values and how we treat people in a good way, um, but just creating a safe space for them. Now, two of the things that we also know that is very difficult to talk about in our community, but also impacts our Native community in which a lot of our communities uh, throughout Indian country um, really don't identify individuals who, who identify, nor do they um, identify the issues that impacts these community. Um, we know that a lot of our individuals who identify have experienced a lot of sexual assaults that were unreported. And a lot of them um, have um, also, especially our young uh, gay males, um, also have experienced uh, sex and human trafficking. But again, I'll get into uh, more of that conversation in the upcoming slides. But um, again, these are a lot of the, the issues that have really impacted um, our community. Um, I also like to allow myself to be a little vulnerable when I talk about this also, because I can say there's a lot of these issues that impacts, um, I've, I have experienced them. Um, and that's where it took me to where a lot of my own healing uh, to get where I'm at today to do the work that I do and the work that I love to do. Now, this was the only research that was ever done um, in regards to, well, I would say one of the first um, um, actually, and this is work that was done by Dr. Karina's Wal Karina Walters and her team out in Washington. Uh, 
And what they did was they went to the six largest two-spirit native LGBTQ urban communities and collected this data. Now, the only thing that that disappointed me in this was the fact that um, we always do really well in urban communities, but we don't do well in the rural or tribal communities. And those are the individuals that I really worry about because they're not getting the proper services. A lot of them have not come out. Um, a lot of them are afraid to come out. Um, a lot of them are bullied and ostracized. A lot of them, a lot of them experience alcohol and drug abuse. Um, and so um, that just saddens me when I think about that. But in this project, what they did was they went to the six largest. Minneapolis and St. Paul was actually one of the communities that they went into. And if you look at the column, the two-spirit versus the heterosexual column, you can see that the many different forms of abuse, um, the two-spirit column is much more higher than the heterosexual. Um, in talking with my colleagues today, and when we talk about this, we believe that the statistics are much more higher. Um, and then also thinking about the unreported, um, which again would probably even skyrocket the, the statistics much more higher. <clears throat> What I like to talk about too is what are some high risk factors for our two spirit uh, native LGBTQ youth? What we know the risks that our two spirit LGBTQ youth um, experience is homelessness, identity issues, incarceration, school dropout, unhealthy relationships, and domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, what I'm liking and what's going on in a project that I was a part of here in Minnesota is that um, there was a survey that was shared um, with, a, with a lot of the schools here in Minnesota. 81% um, of these schools participated. Um, and what they asked these young people, um, both, both all youth, not just a specific group, um, but they they asked him, um, have you ever traded sex for food, water, or shelter? Um, sadly, in Minnesota, uh, with the native population being one of the lowest populations, they actually had the highest. Um, the native youth um, was high, but was what was really astonishing from the, from that report and that study is that the the youth who identified as two spirit or native LGBTQ had the highest rates of um, trading sex for food, water, and shelter. So you so if you think about it, you can only imagine um, how different and how much higher it could possibly be in different states. So again, I was really happy that that um, research was done, but I was also very sad. And then you think about too, like the depression, the me mental health. I'm not sure if a lot of you are familiar. Also, the uh, the Trevor uh, project came out with a report just recently talking about the mental health of youth who identify as LGBTQ or Two Spirit Native LGBTQ. Um, the Two Spirit Native LGBTQ youth um, had the highest rates. So again, if you go to the Trevor project, you can actually look for that research and that report. It's just astonishing. Here are some of the criti crit critical issues affecting L LGBTQ homeless youth. Again, mental health issues. Uh, research has documented uh, there's high rates of depression and substance abuse, um, conflict with the law, prostitution, survival sex, suicide, uh, risky sexual behavior, HIV and AIDS, and sex and human trafficking. When we talk about the rates of suicide, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reported that suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth ages 15 to 24, and is the third leading cause of death of youth from uh, age 10 to 14. So when I go into tribal communities and talk about the rates of um, suicide amongst uh, the youth who identify, uh, one of the things that I always remind uh, tribal communities is that our 
youth who identify should not be killing themselves and that we as Native people are failing them because we're not teaching them the beauty or balance of what it means to be two-spirit, our Native LGBTQ, or, or um, reminding them that they're going to play a role in your community. Um, I worked with an 11-year-old boy um, who identified as gender fluid, but also identified as two-spirit. Um, one of the things that he suffered from was uh, depression and anxiety. Um, his mom was very, very worried about him. And so for me as a mental health provider, provider I always say the Western way of healing has, has its perspective as, as well as the cultural and spiritual aspect of healing um, has theirs. And so when I worked with this young boy, um, one of the things that I focused more on was uh, not his his diagnosis, but um, what was causing those issues. Um, and so by, by, by that, meaning that I also taught him or was teaching him about what it means to be a two-spirit. Um, one of the things I said to him is that one day... <clears throat> You're going to grow up and you're going to help your people. You could be a doctor. You could be a nurse. You could be a lawyer. Um, you could be someone who pours water in the sweat lodge. That's your role. And that's what the role that you'll play in community. And that's how you're going to help your community. Um, I was so very proud of him that when I uh, finished working with him, he actually went back to his tribal school um, where he was from and actually created the first gay and straight alliance in the tribal school, which is really, really amazing. And today he's 17 years old and he's flourishing. Um, so again, I didn't focus on um, the symptom. I focused more on how I could help him um, to love his identity and grow with it and just, and just be himself. So again, here are some more suicide statistics. I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on this. Um, but again, you could see uh, the high rates uh, amongst our female to male transgender and our male to female transgender adolescents. Um, so again, these statistics are, are just astonishing. LGBTQ and sex and human trafficking. So if you want to learn more about uh, human trafficking of our youth, uh, you can actually go to the National Human Trafficking. Um, um, Polaris actually has a, a site that collects a lot of this data, a lot of this research on, our, on the youth. Um, and then also you can go to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They actually have a lot of data in regards to our youth who identify and their experiences with uh, sex and human trafficking. One of the things that really blew me away um, right before COVID, I had attended a webinar that was actually put on by uh, the Missing and Exploited Children's Network, but also another federal agency. And in their um, presentation, they identified that 51% of gay boys are being trafficked. When I questioned them and asked them how much of that data was Native specific, they couldn't answer the question. And we, we know that when data and research is collected, often sometimes what happens is that the proper questions are not being asked. And so some of that data could possibly, possibly have been native and um, we didn't know it because they, again, they didn't ask the proper questions. So again, you know, um, we know that this is a huge issue right now and we're working really hard um, to get our tribes to really, really understand uh, what's happening to our young people. And not only that, I mean, our, our, our young adults. And one of the things that I um, also talk about, too, is that when we talk about human trafficking, we know if we know that an individual um, is being um, trafficked um, and they don't know that they're being trafficked, we can't name that for them, right? They have to come to that space of um, accepting and understanding and knowing what happened to them. But I worked with a 20-year-old um, two-spirit male. Um, and one of the things that um, he was experiencing was um, addiction issues. He, had, he was addicted to meth and he was addicted to heroin. And so one of the things that he did was he would get online, uh, uh, specifically Grinder. And he would go and look for uh, sex parties. Um, and so when he would find a sex party, he would go there on Friday, 
Um, and throughout the weekend, the individual who hosted or the individuals who hosted this party um, fed him with drugs, um, kept him high. Um, multiple men came in and out uh, throughout the whole weekend and had sex with him. Um, he talked about some of the horrible things that they did to him. Um, and so when I'm in person talking about human trafficking of uh, our individuals who identify, um, I always like to share that story. And I always ask people, is that survival sex or is it trafficking? A lot of people look at it as survival sex. Um, yes, it is survival sex because he's getting his addiction met, but it's also trafficking because um, he's not giving consent in who he has sex with. Um, and I imagine that the individuals who are hosting this party are being paid um, some way um, um, by what they're by what they're offering at these parties. So again, it's really important to think about that and um, really, really understand. So again, um, my good friends out in the Shoshone Bannock tribe, uh, Spirit and Clyde, one of the things that they talk about is to be physically present for individuals who identify. Um, you can offer to accompany them, them to, L, to LGBTQ2 and Two-Spirit um, events. Walk with us outside, sit next to us on public transportation, and stand beside us in other spaces to ensure that we have an ally who can provide a physical presence in unsafe places. So again, this is like really important to understand. This is how you can be an ally to uh, my community. Um, you know, for many years, because um, I started doing this work way back in uh, 2010. So I've been doing this work for a really, really, really long time. And this, this quote is very powerful. Um, and, and it's very, it hurts to hear this. Um, but this quote comes for, comes from Beverly Low Thunder, who today is, um, an elder in our community. Um, she's an activist. Um, she actually has a book out there. If anyone is interested, it's her memoir and it's called One Beat at a Time. Um, but her quote is very powerful. And what she says is that the pain of being rejected by one's own people can be the most devastating. So um, I want us all just to take a deep breath. I know that I covered a lot of um, um, violence, you know, and the things that have happened to us as Two-Spirit Native LGBTQ people. But what I'm going to do show now, and I have permission from the families, um, I'm going to be sharing some pictures of Two-Spirit people, um, and I'm going to tell their stories. But I also want you just to take care of yourself. If you need to, you know, smudge yourself down, uh, take a walk away from your computer, um, stretch, do whatever you can to take care of yourself. Um, because again, this is, this stuff is very powerful. It's very impactful. Um, and if you never, ever heard of stuff like this, um, it's just, you know, it's going to be embedded in your mind and you're going to think a lot about this. So what really got me into this work also too, is that with, within my own tribe, within just a little over a two year span, five individuals from my tribal community um, who either identified as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ died by some form of violence. Um, this is one of the reasons why I got into this work in regards to violence against this population, but also because of like what happened to my own uh, community individuals, um, relatives who, who identified and what happened to them. So again, please take care of yourselves because I'm going to be sharing their stories. Um, this is my friend, Jared. Uh, Jared and I went to school together. Um, we were friends in school. Um, even as adults, we were friends. One of the things that um, Jared would often do is that he would um, send me a message on Facebook and he would tease me. Um, one of the things that he would say is he would call me Dr. Hayes and I would laugh at him and tell him, well, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, anyway. And often he would ask me if I would counsel him. And 
I, I had to explain to him that, you know, ethically I couldn't uh, provide these services to him, but really encouraged him to go and find someone um, who he felt safe with and who he could talk with, um, but he never trusted anyone. Um, he suffered from alcohol uh, abuse. Um, he was a really, really, really good by, um, person. Um, Jared was our first victim from our community. Um, Jared was stabbed multiple times um, and blunt force trauma done to his body. Um, today, they have not yet found his killer. Um, and so, again, you know, we know that a lot of um, a lot of our communities talk about individuals that we know of, or just people who they know of who identify who are missing, um, who are, or who have been murdered, and um, often sometimes we don't talk about it um, outside of our community. Um, but again, you know. Um, I did work for Sovereign Bodies for 13 months as their Missing and Murdered uh, Two-Spirit Project Assistant, and I have seen the actual data. They are the only Native organization in the country who actually holds data of Missing and Murdered Two-Spirit people. Um, and so when I looked at all of that data, uh, looked at the names, looked at these individuals, I um, had to smudge myself down and take care of myself because... Um, it was so impactful just to see those names because I knew, I always knew that um, that um, this type of violence um, has occurred on our people, but just was never, ever, you know, documented. Um, our first, our second one was Dallas. Um, from my understanding, um, I talked to his aunt a couple years ago um, and I had asked her, I said, how did Dallas identify? Um, she told me that Dallas identified as transgender. Um, and um, and I didn't know that. Um, so please, um, um, I just want to be respectful and mindful of, of, of them to make sure that I properly talk about them. But in the picture to the uh, right is a picture of Dallas. Um, and the little boy that's with Dallas is actually his son. Him and... Or, uh, actually their son um, and um, they and another two spirit to a uh, female bodied individual wanted to have a child together um, and so that's their son um, Dallas and their brother um, got into an argument they were drinking alcohol um, him and uh, their brother um, got into an argument about Dallas being gay or identifying as gay um, and their brother uh, stabbed him to death in the basement of his grandmother's house. So this was our second uh, death on our reservation. The third one is Vernon. Um, for me, when I look at Vernon, um, personally, I really, I, I always think of Vernon as being a true winkta just because of the roles that he played within our community. Um, he was an advocate and he advocated to our tribal council about same-sex marriage. Um, he was actually one of the, the co-founders of the first Two-Spirit Society in South Dakota, which was the SWO group. Um, he was a sun dancer, um, was involved in ceremony, uh, did a lot of good things, you know, helped our community, helped our people. Um, and so his death is looked at as being a form of um, uh, an issue of domestic violence. So Vernon was a driver for a group of girls. Um, he was a driver for them one night. Um, they went back to one of the females, uh, one of the, the females that he was with, went back to her house. Um, the boyfriend came out and shot them, um, killed them, um, and then killed himself. Um, one of the things that Vernon's family wanted to prove was uh, Vernon's death to be a hate crime because the killer actually shot Vernon um, in the buttocks um, and he was also shot more than the other individuals. And so when it, when his fam family contacted me, um, I actually got them in contact with um, one of the legal organizations in Minnesota 
um, connected them, but what they told uh, Vernon's family was that it would have been really hard to prove that it was a hate crime. Um, so again, not only Vernon's death that night, but um, all the other individuals that was involved was very, very um, impactful on my community. Um, at that time, I was working for Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community as a mental health provider, and um, I was asked to come back and work with my tribe um, and to help them um, work, you know, talk it out uh, within talking circles. Um, I remember when I walked into um, my tribal community, you can actually feel the grief that you could actually cut it with a knife. I mean, that's what it felt like. Um, there was a lot of fear in the community that there was going to be a lot of backlash because of these deaths. So this this incident alone just really, really impacted my community. Ayana, uh, she was our uh, she was our youngest. Um, she was fourteen. Identifies gender fluid. Um, I've seen pictures of her dressed as a female and also dressed as a as, as a male. Um, Ayana, from my understanding, um, was in the middle of the tun our tundra within our tribal um, administration office um, and was talking about bullying and respecting and honoring one another. Um, I mean, that, that, that took a lot of courage um, for her to do that. And um, two months later, Ayana committed suicide. Uh, she didn't leave a note. Um, so nobody knows why she committed suicide. Um, one of the things um, that really, you know, um, again, goes back to what I said earlier, you know, our young people who identify shouldn't be killing themselves because of their identity. Um, but again, you know, um, for me, when I look at suicide, I look at, at, I look at it as violence upon oneself. Um, and that's how I view it. Um, so again, I mean, just, you know, our young, our young people who identify shouldn't be killing themselves. Uh, Raina, um, I haven't heard much lately, but from my understanding, uh, Raina's death is, 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 I believe, still being investigated. Still, um, there's legal stuff that's happening or that's going on from my understanding. But Raina was in the Watertown um, uh, police station. Uh, police station and um she had asked for mental health services um and she was denied and when they went back to check on her uh rain reina had committed suicide she hung herself in her cell um and so again this is this is a legal issue that's still going on um thankfully um stuff like this hasn't happened within my community for quite a number of years but again you know the families wanted me to show their pictures. They wanted me to tell their stories and they didn't want them to be forgotten, but they also wanted people to also understand the violence um, that's perpetrated upon individuals who identify as Two-Spirit or Native LGBTQ across Indian country. So again, um, I share their stories. One of the things I also say too is um, let us not forget our missing and murdered two-spirit Native LGBTQ individuals from across uh, uh, across Indian country and across the country. In conclusion, I want to share this beautiful thing that was also a part of um, Spirit and Clyde's presentation when I was out at Shoshone Bannock Tribe. But what what they presented was when you are born into this world. You reach for either a bowl, an arrow, which is blessed and protected by the sun or grandfather, or you reach for a basket, which is blessed by the moon or grandmother. From that time on, you will follow that vision and be blessed. Thank you. So again, please, I mean, um, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Um, if you have any questions, um, please don't be afraid uh, to ask questions because that's how we learn. You're on mute. All that time to prepare and I was still on mute. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Lenny. That was um, very powerful, very insightful, uh, and you know, honestly, very sad. Uh, but that's why we have to have these conversations. Um, we do know that violence to uh, Native, uh, LGBTQ, and Two Spirit folks is exceedingly high. Um, not just here, but let's everywhere in the world, everywhere. And, um, you know, these conversations need to be had. So thank you so much. And um, I'm putting it out there for folks uh, to ask questions if you like. Please put it in the chat. Um, and, you know, one question I have for you is, uh, you know, do you, have you seen any statistics, you know, for Iowa specifically? Um, no, I haven't. And I, I was expecting that answer, you know, I, th there isn't, right? Um, and that's very sad. There's a lot of states like Iowa that have absolutely no statistics on the violence that uh, Native um, LGBTQ and Two-Spirit folks are facing. And that's why this, I thought this was a very important conversation to have. Well, one of the things that I that I always talk about too about doing this work for quite a number of years is that what I seen uh, 12, 15 years ago, um, you didn't see anything. We're seeing things now and we're talking about things, which is a good thing, but it's not moving as fast as I would like it to, be, you know, uh, to be moving. Because again, you know, when you talk about all this violence, you know, sex and human trafficking. Um, um, we're not getting proper data, but we also know what's happening. So again, if you think about like the individuals that I worked with, you know, giving examples that I know they're being trafficked, but they don't know they're being trafficked, right? They have to name it themselves. Um, and so um, hearing those things are um, from different people, we know it's happening, but it's just, it, the data is not there. That's the, hu the huge issue. They're not collecting proper data. I mean, there's already a lack of data for indigenous peoples yep. in terms of the violence that we're facing, um, you know, going missing, being murdered, uh, assaulted, all those things. Um, firstly, because um, sometimes uh, we are, um, uh, I guess mis mis uh, mislabeled, <laughs> you know, uh, as to who we are, who we how we identify. Um, so there's um you know and there's then as and how we identify even personally because you know being born indigenous is a political act these days, right? Well, it's always been a political act since invasion. Um, so there's been a real loss of culture and identity as well. So how people identify even can be very difficult. Um, yeah. And then, then you get into the realm of, you know, um, two-spirit and LGBTQ folks and, you know, with already uh, broken identities um, and uh, very um, difficult uh, situations. And, you know, then it's even, there's even more fractured identities arising. And mm -hmm. so that's... And then that, but that's that, that that's like the, the, the state is not taking any of this into consideration. And that's what really bothers mm -hmm. me. You know, and the thing too that um, I always remind people too is that before colonization, um, our individuals who identified were looked upon as spiritual beings because of the roles that we played in community, um, which was various, various different roles. But today, were looked upon as sexual beings. Mm. And what I mean by that, that were viewed as sexual beings is because when people um, look at somebody who, it's always in a way, right? And I, and I mean, like, um, and I'm not being to reality, identifies often sometimes people think um i wonder if he or she's the top or bottom that's what i mean about going straight to that sexual um thinking that sexual view as the individual when someone like me who's native and before colonization we were looked upon as spiritual beings because of our 
the roles that we played in community. Even though we may have had been married, um, but the reality of it, it is it, it was a spiritual thing. It wasn't a bad thing. Well, it was it was a role that you what played. What do you think in, of that? In, yeah, it's a role you played in community. I mean, it's the role we all play in a community goes far beyond our sexuality. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, Christianity, um, Christian homophobia, um, you know, I, I blame, you know, uh, Christian colonial capitalism for this. Um, it's uh, it's reduced. It's reduced um, uh, to spirit and native or just LGBTQ people in general, you know, to that function, mm -hmm. which um, is is why. Well, which is why I'm glad that you're around and I'm glad <laughs> that you're doing the work you're doing, <laughs> you know, because, <laughs> you, you know, we got to combat that. And um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and so, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I, geez, I mean, I, I have a lot of questions, you know, um, but also I'm trying to leave some room for other folks and actually we don't, yeah, we're, we're, I don't, we don't have any questions. I've been getting a lot of like private messages though from people and they're telling me how um, happy they have been to be able to see this presentation and how much they've learned. That's awesome. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how I, I personally haven't seen something like this, you know, in Iowa, like, you know, broadcast across like the state of Iowa before and, you know, Nebraska, well, I mean, it's being broadcast everywhere really, but our focus is Iowa and Eastern Nebraska. So I'm hoping that it, you know, we'll get to folks in this area and we can have more conversations and we can increase our awareness and our strength as a uh, native, um, you know, uh, um, two, two spirit and LGBTQ folks. Oh, and we do have one question. Um, oh, from my friend, Mohammed. Mohammed is on the, Mohammed Troy is on the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission with myself. Um, he asks, can you say more on the spiritual component in terms of how, um, and I'll just put it up here, how natives were viewed in the past. So when we talk about the spiritual component, what that means is that the individual played a huge part in ceremony, meaning that they, they may have poured water, they may have done other um, things in regards to healing, um, that's what we talk about, that spiritual part. Um, because like one of the things that um, I learned for myself and even through my own healing is that because of the, the horrible things that happened to me, that I was bullied, I was ostracized for who I was, I also carried internalized homophobia. And so I hated myself so much, right? Mm -hmm. And so, but through my healing, I was able to through my healing, but also my understanding and the role that I play as an individual who identifies as a Winkta and a Two-Spirit is that I was able to walk into that understanding of my role, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm very passionate about, like, um, um, you know, being a mental health provider, because I'm sitting with people, I'm counseling people, I'm listening to them, I'm talking with them, I'm giving them advice. That is sort of like a, like a, a spiritual um, uh, way of doing work, right? Like mm -hmm. what I would also do in my work a lot too is like connecting that spiritual aspect of healing, like telling people I work with the importance of just going to sitting with an elder, an elder with good medicine, you know, so it's all about sharing medicine and helping one another, right? So I look at the spiritual part as being a lot of different things, right? But specifically to your question, that would be like the role through ceremony, right? But if you really look at it and really think about it too, like even as being a um, mental health provider, Native, someone who identifies, I'm actually making ceremony with people. We're making ceremony right now because we're sitting here having a conversation between two Indigenous people, right? Mm -hmm. That's making medicine. That's making ceremony. Yeah, and Mohammed also asked, he was curious to know about like more specifics, like were there general jobs or positions even 
um, that, you know, that, that uh, two spirit folks took on? Well, I mean, if you think about Pine Leaf Woman, right? Yeah. Pine Leaf Woman was a chief. She was, yes. a, she was, she was a war leader, right? Mm -hmm. So that would, that's, that's a role that she played, right? Yeah. And then if you look at it today, if you, I don't know if you do a lot of research or study or if you just read, but in some specific tribes, they actually have individuals who identify who are now like chairman of their um, tribal community or their vice chair or their secretary. Those things are finally happening today in, in our modern time. But those were the roles that we also played before colonization. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, it's it's not like we have to necessarily always look at folks as something um, special either. Like, you know, they, they were part of the community and yes. they played roles and they were normal people as well. You know, um, I also like to say that to folks, too, like because we you know, I don't want to over I don't want to romanticize and tokenize to spirit mm -mm. folks either, you know. I, I just I, I want I want people to know that they they played you know significant roles in every aspect, and I that that to me is important. You know, and the way that I see it too is I don't look, like to look at it like like one being better than the other. Yeah, right. Yeah. We, were, we were all equal. We were mm -hmm. we were all equal in what we did, and and we played different roles. I mean, you've seen the slide of the different roles that were played in community. Yeah. Um. But they, but they were all important roles. Yep, absolutely. Well, I I don't know. Do you have any uh, any more anything else you'd like to say um, before we hop off? Well, I do want to like encourage. I mean, um, please get my information from the organizer if you would yes. like. But I actually I actually do like full eight day uh, full eight hour training. Um, where I go even to in, into much more than what I just talked about in this hour and a half or whatever. Um, I mean, I really break it down. And I would love for folks out here to know that, um, you know, like even uh, Mohammed, who was on here, uh, part of our Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you know, maybe that's something we can do, um, you know, for, for folks in Iowa City so that we can do better. Um, there mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, cities actually should be taking these trainings on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, universities, um, and even organizations, um, yep. you know, I can think of a few, um, uh, like nonprofits that could really use this training, to be honest. Yeah. So um, I'm going to definitely push that out there. And um, what, um, how do people get a hold of you? Like, should I put it in the chat? Sure. Um, I do have a website. Uh, my website okay. is www.tatetopa.com. Okay. That's my website. I do have a lot of information on there. Um, I do have some resources. One of the things that I've been doing um, for my website is that, uh, is that I've been collecting stories of in digital stories of individuals who identify. Mm -hmm. um, which is really, really important. And then I do have some educational videos in there. And yeah. then I also, I also do a lot of work in regards to sexual violence against men and boys. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I'm off, often being talked to or asked to do is just specifically talk about the LGBTQ or two-spirit native LGBTQ community um, when it comes to sexual violence, but our sexual abuse, um, male violence. Um, I always really sort of stay away from that. Because what we're trying to do and what I'm trying to do in my work is that we know that sexual violence happens to males. But the stigma that we're trying to break down is that a lot of people still believe that individuals who identify who were sexually abused as children and grew up to identify, that's why they're gay. Yeah, I, I really, really like. Um, um, well, that's a Christian. That's a Christian uh, construction for sure. Yes, yes. Um, and then I did a I did a training for um, tribal programs, tribal colleges, and it was really hard to get this woman to understand um, that. 
that that just doesn't happen to individuals who identify. It also happens to individuals who identify as heterosexual. Um, I had an advocate reach out to me from North Dakota to have a conversation, and she was going to be working with a with a male that was raped by another male. Mm-hmm. And her first question to me was, "How do I help him?" And I responded to her by saying, "Well, you would help him just the same way as you would help a woman: compassion, mm-hmm. love, kindness." listen to him. So by the time we were done with our conversation, she finally came to realize and talked about that she had her own biases about males getting raped. Mm. So again, so that's one of the things too, when I work with advocates is like, we need to challenge our biases because if we have biases against, um, individuals who identify are just males Mm -hmm. in specific that are sexually abused, we're not going to provide the proper services to them. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to be willing to challenge our own biases. And that's why I'm always telling our tribal communities, if you have a personal bias against um, individuals who identify and you may be a foster parent, right? Mm Because I do, I do work in child welfare. And one of the things I talk about is that, and also advocate for, is that we need a curriculum specifically for native foster parents of, for youth who identify. I always say our Indian people mean well, they want to help our people, right? They want to help our children. But if you're, if you put a child in a home where there's homophobic slurs that are being used and that child hears that and that child wants to come out, that child's not going to come out. Yeah, absolutely. It's only, it's only going to create more mental health issues. Well, and then again, even, oh, go on, sorry. I always talk about the grooming process too. I mean, because yeah. often sometimes, you know, um, you may have an individual who is a groomer, going to groom that child, possibly even hurt that child. That child's going to run to the streets and become a bigger target for victimization, which is sex and human trafficking. So and- again... Yeah. Yeah. And I know I keep bringing it back to Christianity, but Christianity is a form of grooming as well. Yep. You know, and I was wondering uh, in your longer sessions, do you mention, do you talk about how religion had a big part to play in this? Um, Oh yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Cause I I would love to hear some of that. Oh, we do have one more question. Um, Yeah. We'll have time for one more question before we get off. And this is from Keenan from one Iowa. So, and one Iowa is one of our, is, is the other co-hosts for this event. So I'm very glad that oh, Keenan was able to, yeah, to, to um, ask a question. European cultures often associate gender with things like different forms of dress, colors, et cetera. Uh, gender is obviously very different in native populations. What kinds of things designated gender? Um, that's a really difficult question to answer because remember what I said earlier, that in in various different tribal communities, there was no so such different. word for yeah. yeah. There, we're we're so was, different everywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, there was and there was and there was no such word for gender. Like you know, I'm really good friends with Sarah Deer, and one of the things that I learned about her tribe is that she said we don't have a word for gender. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So again, we have to think outside of that box. We yeah. have to understand and know that it's different throughout Indian country. Yeah. And more importantly, to also understand too that the communities, tribal communities, do not use the word or call themselves two spirit, right? And that's why it's always been very. And I'm always encouraging people. It's always important just to simply ask someone. Um, how do you identify? Mm-hmm. And again, with this whole pronouns thing too, it's not something that I that um, I respect people who want to use pronouns, but I always tell people, remind people, then you also need to respect people who choose not to use pronouns, mm-hmm. right? But again, it's something that we're being forced to do. Like, you know, my colleagues um, who work for the state of Minnesota they have gotten to the point where they got so tired of people asking them to say their pronouns that they actually started announcing themselves in their Indian name and that shuts down the conversation. Mm-hmm. Which is amazing because, you know, um, 
So I always remind non-native people or even just our native people, like if you're going to ask someone to be respectful, instead of saying which pronouns you use, what we should be doing is, is um, saying to people, if you prefer to use pronouns, which ones? Mm. That's much more respectful than just blurting yeah. it out, saying which pronouns you use. You know, so again, but I always tell people I don't use them, but I always say to people, my name is Lenny. I'm Lenny. I'm a human being. If you want to talk about me in a sentence, it's okay to use he, him, and his, but it's also important to remember that when I'm around my feminine native friend, native male friends, often sometimes we will call each other she or her and that's okay. But if you mm -hmm. call me she or her without my permission, that's being disrespectful. Mm-hmm. You know, so what I'm always trying to do is just to give people a different perspective because sometimes we can just get stuck on one perspective. I love that perspective. I've put that myself actually over the years. And it's something that's always bothered me and made me feel just very boxed in. Um, yeah. And yeah, as Indigenous peoples, like, you know, I, I don't, it's hard for me sometimes to call people they because it feels so um, disconnected. <sighs> And I, I, I'm like, oh, I, it's hard for me to do that. Um, you know, I, I wish. You know what other word? The other what? word I don't like, what I don't like is the word other. So like when I work with like organizations too, and we look at the paperwork and stuff, you know, when we talk about like allowing people to write in how they identify, Oh, what I always that, yes. discourage people to do yeah. is to like put a uh, put a box and write other. When we use that language, other, it's almost like we're dehumanizing that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why I really dislike that word other too. So I, in in my trainings, I do a lot of, of um, work in regards to helping people. Like, how do you like um, your applications or your your intake forms or whatever, whatever forms you use, what kind of language are you, are you using on there? Mm -hmm. When I work with organizations where, um, um, who serve uh, uh, our relatives who are in domestic violence relationships, like I have walked mm -hmm. into organizations and the first thing that I would do is I would look around to see if there was anything there that signaled that they would work with someone like me. And if I didn't, then I would say to the executive director, so what are you doing to help the community to know that you're here for them? Because a lot of people can say, you know, I am being inclusive or I am here for the community. But if you're not showing it, mm -hmm. then you're really not doing it. And I always like to, like my friend Maddie Jim, um, one of the things I learned from her is um, when we talk about policies, Policies can be written, but policies can also be changed. Yeah. You know, and you're making me think right now about, you know, the English language <laughs> is not limited, is not limited to creating, you know, better, better words. Um, it's, it's, it's the, it's the culture. It's, it's, it's the culture that's come from, uh, you know, Europe, the culture created in US, the U.S. and Canada that's limited in understanding gender. And, um, and, and sexuality and all that, you know, and how you can, how you can identify there's, there's limited fluidity. And so that's why we're stuck with these very limited pronouns. Um, and, and, you know, uh, that's why we need to, I'm, I'm so glad that we're reviving our ways. And I really want to see a lot of people, um, identify with our ways moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for inviting me. Oh, I, it was so great. I learned a lot. Um, and uh, we have a lot of great comments on here. And um, it was shared out quite a lot. So, you know, we really appreciate your time. And um, for uh, I would like again to say thank you to One Iowa for co-hosting this event um, and with, with, the, with us, Great Plains Action Society. And I would really encourage everybody to go to tatetopa.com. T A T E T O P A dot com uh, and check out Lenny's work um, and, you know, do more for your organization, your workplace, your, I mean, your city, whatever, you know, we need people like Lenny to, to teach us more about this topic. So thank you so much, everybody. And I hope you have a good evening.